we have a take out supper coming up on the 8th. Uh, tickets are available for $20 each. Uh, there's a number of people here. I have tickets. Uh, Don has tickets. Uh, or just let the office know and we'll get you a ticket. So $20, that's for the 8th. It's a cold plate, uh, sliced ham, potato salad, beans, some buns, uh, and it's my dessert. So get your tickets for that. There's only a limited number, 250, I believe. So first come, first serve for those. Uh, our maintenance bank service will be coming up on June 19th. That will be a joint service at 10.30, Ken? Yep, 10.30 at Maintenance Bank, weather permitting. If the weather's bad, we're back here. But we'll know there on that day. And the following Sunday on June 26th is our Winthrop Ballpark. It's a joint service to Winthrop uh, Cabin. Um, that will be at 10.30 at the Winthrop Ballpark. They're selling tickets for that because we're going to have a light uh, lunch right after that, soup and sandwich. Uh, ten tickets are $10, and I do have tickets for that one. And then a very exciting coming up on June 12th, we have a triple baptism. So three children being baptized into our family of faith. Uh, really exciting uh, for that one. And then June 20th at 7.30, here on Song, are back in here to celebrate Phyllis Hall with music again. It's been over two years since we've had them here to be able to sing. It's just a free will donation. All proceeds go to the Huron Women's Shelter. So great uh, concert, great music, and, and good music. Uh, so come on out and enjoy that. And then July, we will be in shutdown mode. So we'll be shut down through that month of uh, July. And I believe that's all I have. <coughs> oh, oh. Um, there is a non-denominational service coming up in September, uh, September 18th at 10 a.m. That's at the Seaforth Agricultural Center. Uh, Margaret is looking to form a choir. Uh, anybody that wants to sing in the choir, let her know. Practices will start early September, Margaret? The last Wednesday of August and the first two Wednesdays of September. Okay, so Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock? Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, the last Wednesday of August, first two Sundays, uh, Wednesdays of September. Our choir practice, and it's just, this is going to be a joint effort for all the local churches. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a really good concert and a uh, really meaningful service coming up for that. Uh, so put that one in your calendars. Uh, that's all I have. Is there anything else we need to share with each other this morning? Thank you, Kay, there, for bringing your gift of music to us today. Okay, we're going to begin by letting your Christ candle. We like this candle to remind us that the light of Christ is always with us, in our hearts, dispelling the darkness. The light of Christ. And in keeping with recent United Church practices and fulfilling the call to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Report, we in the United Church of Canada recognize the Aboriginal peoples of this land, the Inuit and the Métis, as the original stewards of this land. We are all people of these treaties signed in good faith. Let us live up to the spirit of these treaties in all our undertakings, respecting the land and learning from these people. The grace of the Messiah Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, be with you all. Jesus said, Do not cling to me. Go tell my friends that I am sending to my God and your God. While he blessed them, Jesus parted from them, and a cloud took them out of their sight. The man wearing a crown of thorns is now Lord of all the earth. Sing praises to God. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. And we're going to open up with hymn 330 Jesus Shall Reign. 330. Thank you. 
here. It's a spool of thread. Now, do you think if I tied you up with one wrapping of that thread around you, do you think it would hold you very still for very long? Probably not. You just braid your hand and snap the thread. And what happens if I wrap it around you twice? You think that'll hold you secure? Probably not. It's a pretty thin thread. Two wrappings there. Raise your arms and you'd be out. Just snap it. Now, imagine if I wrapped this whole spool around you, and then I took another spool and wrapped that around you. And I took another one. I took half a dozen spools of thread, wrapped it around you. At that point, I think you might have trouble opening your arms here to snap that thread, to break it. Because each one adds a little more strength to the whole. You know, that's a lot like us in our faith. Alone, yes, we can have a strong faith, but in the great scale of things, it's still relatively weak. Just like a single strand of thread. But as more and more people come to join in sharing our faith together, the stronger we become, and it becomes harder and harder to us, for us to break apart. And that is what we're going to read in today's Gospel reading. Jesus is praying that we may be one, just as God and Jesus are one. We all have different... We all have slight differences in how we go about worshiping, but our fundamental beliefs are all the same. They're so similar. This last week, I had lunch there with other clergy in Seaford. Brian from Edmundville, Reverend Mary from the Edmundville Church, Father Philip from the Catholic Church. We all worship the same God, even though we do it slightly different from each other. But because we're worshiping the same God, we are all brothers and sisters. We are all come together. Now, sadly, there are some faiths out there that will try to divide you up. They'll try to tell you you're not a Christian because you don't worship exactly as they do. And I've been told in my face by somebody from one of those more fundamentalist denominations that I wasn't a Christian because I didn't believe exactly the way they believe. And all I can do is feel sorry for them and pray for them. Even look at our politicians in recent years. They're trying to push forward on a personal agenda which does not have the popular support of the people behind it. So how do they get their agenda forward? They divide the people up. They may play the race card and say, that person's black, he's not a real person, you know, he's going to take your job. Or that person over there, he's not a Christian, play the, the religious card, he's Muslim, you don't want anything to do with him. They will say what they do to break up people. And <coughs> people there that we may end up thinking don't have, deserve our respect. But yet, we're all working together. We all believe in the same God. And you know, that goes against the prayer that Jesus prays in our gospel reading today. It is only by sticking together, by being one, as Jesus prayed for us, that we can overcome the overall evil in the world, to spread the good news in the world. I'm always reminded of a saying by a First Nation elder I knew, uh, Casey Eaglesby, he's a Blackfoot elder out in the West. Casey Eaglesby speaks, told me so long ago that we need to focus more on our commonalities and not get hung up so much on our differences. And if you were to look at it objectively, you would see our commonalities outweigh our differences. And that's the wonderful thing about this. When we all pray together, when we work together for a common goal, when we work to serve God through Jesus, each of us is a little safer than as if we all worked individually to be faithful to God. So come together, strengthen yourself, because in togetherness, there is strength. Amen. Let us pray. Most loving God, we believe that Jesus has been gathered to your right hand and made the hope of the universe. We pray for his universal love to captain to captivate, to captivate our lives. May we, in heart and mind, daily live through him, close to you, and discover the glory of heaven, which is here on earth for those who believe. To your praise and through his name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. 
And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. And then he led, and then he led them as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. The words of the Lord. And our second gospel reading today comes from the gospel according to John. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. To the, the glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, and they, they become completely one. So the world may know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that only those, I desire that those also whom you have given to me may be, may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you sent me. I have made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that they, so that the love which which you love me may be in them, and I in them. The Gospel of Christ. Hear what these ancient words are saying to us today. And I think we need to sing another song. Five, six, seven. Will you come and follow me? Hymn five, six, seven.
as you open the tomb and raise Jesus to new life. So open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. And in confidence, go forth to live what you show us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in 2001, journalist Giles Brandon interviewed South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu. <coughs> now, Desmond Tutu had dedicated his whole life to bringing justice, peace, and equality to the people of South Africa. He campaigned tirelessly against apartheid, the apartheid regime, and saw the abolishment of apartheid in South Africa. Now, there were countless questions that, that Brandon wanted to ask the old bishop, and Brandon realized that his interview, this interview could very well be the last one for Desmond Tutu because he'd just recently been diagnosed with cancer. So he decided to ask the bishop to choose the topic of conversation. What do you want to talk about? He asked Desmond, this giant of a man. Possibly going through his head, what would Desmond Tutu choose to talk about? He wondered, because Desmond Tutu played a leading role in transforming his country, transforming the world politics. He worked with almost all the powerful leaders in the world he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Just what topic would he choose to talk on? And all those were important topics. They weren't the important, they weren't the number one priority for Desmond Tutu. Desmond said, if, I'm going, if this is going to be my last interview, I'm glad we're not going to talk about politics. Let us talk about prayer and adoration, about faith, hope, and forgiveness. Of all the topics that Desmond could have talked about, he talked about the one nearest and dearest to him. He wanted to talk about his faith in God. If you knew that today was going to be your last day on the planet, what would you want to pray for? I think we all want to focus on our number one priority, our most heartfelt desires. Well, that's what Jesus did in that gospel reading today. In our gospel reading from, from John, it was the last major prayer that Jesus prayed before his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. Now let's face it, Jesus had just finished three years of a very intense ministry. His disciples had been with him throughout. They traveled throughout Judea. Thousands of people had heard his message. They had seen his miracles. And by his coming death and subsequent resurrection, he would save all of humanity from the power of sin and open the door to eternal life. What else could there be on Jesus' to-do list? Now, it may be surprising but what Jesus prayed for was for us, you and me. Just listen to that line again in the prayer. My prayer is not for them alone, as he was speaking about his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. He was praying for those who would come to know him through the message of the disciples. That's you and me, because we were the ones that came to believe in the message. Us. Jesus' final prayer was for his disciples, his nearest and dearest friends, and then for us, all who would come to believe in him. That's what Jesus prayed for. And why? Why was his final prayer for us? Well, one reason I think is, Jesus knew his work wasn't over. There was still work to be done. Jesus still had an agenda that needed to be followed, and you and I are an integral part of that undertaking. There is still work that needs to be done, and we need to be the ones to do it. Bill Crowder tells a story of one of his friends from Bible College, Macaulay Riviera. Now, Macaulay had two dreams in his life. One was to marry his college sweetheart, Sharon, and the second one was to start up an inner city church in downtown Washington, D.C., his old neighborhood. Now, anyone that knew Macaulay knew he had a great passion for spreading the good news of Jesus in his old neighborhood. But sadly, just before graduation, Macaulay and Sharon were killed in a tragic car accident. At Macaulay's memorial service, the pastor stood up and he proclaimed, Mac is gone. And quite dramatically he asked, who will take his place? Who will serve in his place? What happened next? A dozen students, fellow students of Macaulay, stood up and they committed themselves then and there to spreading the good news of Jesus in those inner city areas of D.C. In Macaulay's place. They picked up where he had left off. Now, coaches, sports coaches often use the term next man up. 
And I think that's a term that's used in the military as well. It means if somebody should go down for whatever reason, somebody else is there ready to step up and take their place. In sports, it means every player is ready and willing to step up and willing to step up in order to do the collective job to keep the team going. And this often allows teams to continue to win even after major setbacks, like an injury to a star player. No matter what, the work has to go on. Jesus' work has to go on. Jesus' work of bringing the kingdom of God to earth. And we all have a part to play in that. We are all part of that team. We all need to be able to step up when it's needed. It's also true in terms of individual acts of discipleship. Jesus shared the love and the message of God with thousands of people while he walked on earth. But he couldn't do it all. He couldn't complete the work. There was still a large world out there that needed to hear the word. He left lots of work for us to do, for you and me. And our prayers and our availability will decide how much impact we will have for the kingdom of God. So why was Christ's prayer for his disciples and for us? Obviously, because it was because there is so much more work to be done. We all have a part to play in carrying out that work. And this is also to say that we've been entrusted with the work of God and the Savior. And God will give us what we need to complete that work, to succeed in His service. Our task may change as we grow and we go through life, but God will always be there to give us the tools and the support we need to do the job. There's a story about a young man named Pat Durkin. He loved to serve. He was an avid surfer. However, one day he was out surfing and he was hit by a particularly rogue wave, a large one, ended up breaking his back, left to go quadriplegia. Pat spent months in physical therapy and ended up in a wheelchair, nevertheless. But he never lost his faith in God. Even after that accident, he had trouble understanding why God would allow him to endure the loss of his arms and his legs. But then Pat's church joined a ministry called the Wounded Warriors Project. This wonderful ministry provided lunch and a listening ear to injured service people at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. There, Pat found his calling. He discovered that his ability allowed him to earn the trust of the injured veterans. They saw that he understood their suffering and their scars, and they listened to him when he told them about the great news of God and how God had given them the strength to go through the loss of his arms and legs. Pat's ministry, Pat looks at his ministry as the place God had given him. And he says, it's a God thing I feel called to do. It's an amazing attitude to develop in the face of such a disability, that God allowed him to take that disability and use it for God's glory in the service of his fellow people. What is it that you feel particularly called to do because of your faith in Christ? Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, I don't really feel called. I'm not qualified for anything. But here's what we need to understand. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. In Jesus' final prayer, he says in effect that God, he says in effect to God, if the believers just stay in relationship with me, I will stay in relationship with you. You will enable them to do my work. We don't need to rely on our own talents and strengths or intellect to do God's will. God will give us the strength and the tools to work and do God's work here on earth and ultimately have an impact on the world. It reminds me of something that Bob Goff once said. Now, Goff is the founder of Love Does. It's an international humanitarian organization. And he says, quote, God asks what it is that he made us to love, what it is that captures our attention, what feeds that deep, indescribable need of our needs to experience the richness, richness of the world that God made. And then, leaning over us, God whispers in our ears, let's go do this together. Think about that. Let's go do this together. God wants us to do his work with joy. He knows that we yearn for a greater purpose and calling than just taking care of our own immediate needs. We were created to be something more noble and heroic work, a work that has an eternal impact on the world. And God is ready to equip us to do that work. God leans over and says to us, let's go do that together. 
Why does Jesus smile a prayer for us? Because there's work to do, and because he wants to give us the power and enable us to do our part in that work. But there's one more thing we need to see. Jesus' final prayer is a reminder that we need to work together to complete the mission to which God has called us. This last prayer of Jesus is often called the unity prayer. Jesus knew that a unified effort multiplies our individual efforts far beyond what we could ever accomplish on our own. When I first asked my wife to marry me, I said to her, if we work together as a team, we will accomplish far more than the two of us working separately. Our combined efforts multiply our results. Not too long ago, a decade or so ago, the company named Google, it's still the company there that you see on the internet, spent millions of dollars on a project they call Project Aristotle. The project took its name from a saying of Aristotle, which is, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This project was designed to try and create these perfect work teams with a mixture of personal character traits and habits, Google set up to determine what leads to the most productive and most unified teams. Project Aristotle involved measuring nearly every aspect of the employees' lives. The company's executives interviewed hundreds of employees over several years. They analyzed the, all sorts of data on productivity and innovation in almost every aspect and every team of the company. And all this in-depth research yielded some very interesting results. It was found that the best teams have members who are sensitive to one another's needs and who listen to each other. That was the major conclusion that came out of that study. Education, skill sets, charisma, none of these really have a great impact on creating successful teams. Creating a, but creating a successful atmosphere of psychological safety where members are respected and listened to and able to contribute to the work creating those perfect teams people that were able to work in harmony with one another and build on each other. So stop and think about this for a moment. Jesus had the power to heal the sick, cast out the demons, calm storms, multiply food by thousands, feed thousands. He had the power to come back from the dead after his resurrection. He was going to death to grant these powers and authority to his followers. And yet, the greatest power that Jesus desired for his followers was unity. Why? Because as he said, because of our unity, people will know that Jesus is who he says he is. That's interesting when you consider all the division that's going on in our country and in the world today. Just listen to what Jesus said in verses 22 and 23. I have given them the glory you gave me, the glorious unity of being one, as we are, I in them and you in me, all being perfected into one so that the world will know you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. Not our preaching, not our miracle working, not our building of beautiful churches and cathedrals, nothing is as important as our unity in Christ. Our unity will prove to the world that Jesus is the Son of God and that God loves us intimately. The composer, Giacomo Puccini, wrote a number of famous operas there in the early parts of the 20th century. And in 1922, he was working on his greatest opera, Pteranodont. But it was during that year that he found he had cancer. He told his students at the time, if I do not live to finish Pteranodont, I will want you to finish it for me. Imagine hearing that from the master. If I don't finish my work, I will want you to finish it for me. Well, shortly after that, Puccini did pass away, and his students took up the reins to carry on his work. They studied his opera carefully, and soon they had it completed. Then in 1926, Arturo Toscani, a student of Puccini, directed the world premiere of Tyrannodon in Milan. There, when they got to the part of the opera where Puccini had, had to stop, he put his but Tom down and began to cry, and he turned to the audience and said, Thus far the Master has written, but he has died. And he picked up the baton again and said, But his students have finished, his disciples have finished his work. And when Tyrannodon finished, the audience broke into a thunderous applause, standing ovation. Together the students were able to complete the work of the Master. 
There is so much more work needed to be done to spread the message of Jesus around the world. Thus far, the Master has written, but he has died. His disciples will finish his work. We are his disciples. Today, we are an integral part of the plan for the world, just as Christ's first disciples were. Our unity multiplies our efforts far beyond what we can ever accomplish on our own. What is God telling of us for the sake of spreading his message? How can we join together with other believers around the world to accomplish this? What that is the task for us that awaits us in the 21st century. So are you ready to be that next person up? To take that next step? Are you ready to take the work of the Master and continue it on? Are you ready to do the job and take that job to the next level? Together we can do this. As God whispers in our ear, let us do this together. Amen. Continue with a prayer of thanksgiving. God of the humble and the homeless, the poor and the persecuted, we thank you for exalting the name of Jesus and giving you a name which is above all the names of Jesus. Today we rejoice. Strengthen them, strengthen the resolve 
that they may ultimately find victory and know that you are truly your God. And we pray for those who be named now in the signs of our hearts and those whose names are known to you alone, Lord. We hold up before you in our hearts and with the words of our lips. Lord, For the unity of your church around the world, we pray, O oh God, hear our prayer and receive in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, all praise, honor, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now I invite you all to join in the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Find us the enemy, the power of our Lord, forever and ever. Amen. And now a prayer over the gifts that you left on your way in. For the wondrous way this offering will bless this community and the world, we dedicate to these gifts. For the ways it will help us to be witness to God's love and compassion, we dedicate these gifts. Let this offering and the work of our hands and feet be a part of our lives as we stand for the community of faith. And our closing prayer today is hymn 422. God be with you till we meet again. 422. And now, that peace that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge of God's total and inclusive love. Show to us when he sent his son Jesus to teach us the meaning of that love. And that Jesus, same Jesus is still saving and redeeming broken hearts and lives to this very day. And the blessing of God, the Creator, the Sustainer, and the Redeemer, be with you all and remain with you always.